allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Welcome to this small but enthusiastic and energetic crowd. Um, Alders... Truster, Wolf, Bitters, Damro, Schneider, and Rindfleischer excused. Um, I would ask for a motion to approve the minutes from our March 28th, 2017 meeting. Make a motion to approve the minutes from the March 28th, 17 meeting. Is there a second? Second. And discussion. Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye. Um, we do provide for a public forum on agenda items only. Uh, three minutes. There is no need to sign up in advance. Uh, do we have any speakers this evening? We do not. Let's move on to 2.1, which is a fire department job description review. And I think we'd have Chief Romas and Sandy Rora come up to join us. Madam Chair, would you like me to say something? I don't know. That's don't totally know. up to you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Um, we've been up here before. We explained everything to you. You have all the documents. Does anyone have any questions at all about anything? We'd be more than happy to answer them. Yes, please. I have a few questions. I was unable to be here through some of your chats. Mm -hmm. But I read the same, um, the city survey. Mm -hmm. There were 60 complaints from the people who would work within the fire department in that study. <clears throat> and everybody was complaining about stuff. But when you guys went and did this whole study, everything was peaches and cream. And could I just interrupt to say we are recording? So if you could use your microphones. Oh, you can't hear me? Well, I can certainly hear you, but the, our fans at home may have some trouble. So I guess I'm in a quandary. If everything is so perfect, when you guys did all your checking, and mm -hmm. Sandy, we had this discussion, everything was so perfect, where do you feel that those complaints were based on that? I appreciate your question. However, I think you're wrong. I went through all 406 comments. There were 11 that pertained to the fire department. And of those 11, there were four categories, and um, none of them were about morale, none of them were about budget, none of them. So I don't know. Sandy, could you interject? Because you gave from. me pages and pages and pages that were just from the fire department. Are you talking just, about the 2017 study? I'm not study? talking about where everybody chipped. You're, I'm talking about the employee. Hmm? The me, employee survey, not the... Let, let I me, apologize if I didn't make my I'm, point clear. Okay, I need to have a little bit of time then. You are referring to specific answers or comments that came out of the 2017 study. You are referring to the 2016 study. If that's the one you gave. Yeah. The employee yeah. survey. Correct. Yeah, there, there's been an updated survey. It's done annually. The study does talk about morale issues. It does not say everyone because I think it's a uh, it's an overstatement to say that everyone in the department has morale issues. There are some people that absolutely had morale issues when I was doing this study, but I believe I referred to, to morale issues having to do with accountability. <coughs> some of the findings that I came up with, accountability was the biggest recommendation from some of the, the strongest opinions, is that they don't feel that there's accountability or follow through, and that was addressed in this study. Thanks. Mr. Nelson. I just have a couple of questions on some of the um, job descriptions, and I might not have the most recent ones, at least they were, I thought they were the most recent when I got them. Um, basically, the assistant fire chief and the deputy fire chief. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of these are kind of, I don't want to say picky, but they're a little picky questions, but I, I was kind of thinking that there'd be a consistency among 
the descriptions and and some of them they talk about shift commander and some of them they talk about battalion chief which i understand is really the same thing now they are one and the same mm -hmm. so should not these descriptions be consistent i mean one says shift commander the next one says battalion chief and as i say i understand it's picky but it's it's uh it kind of confuses me and uh <clears throat> as long as we're writing new descriptions, they should be con you know, consistent. The other question I had had to do with the deputy fire chief versus the assistant fire chief, and I was trying to get a handle on because when I read the descriptions, uh, and I understand that probably a lot of it overlaps, but I don't really understand the big difference between them. Some of the primary differences in the, in the state is the rank assistant fire chief is second in command deputy fire chief is traditionally third, third. some cities about 20 percent are flip-flop but that's the majority and the staffing the the shift commanders in about 2013 12. when you came oh, on when board, i came on board yeah were, 14 were modified so you see some language in the past that said shift commanders all of that has been so you'd uh, say the most converted. recent ones now, yes. Italian consistent, uh, internally consistent. Correct. Yes. Okay, because I, 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 I don't think I got a copy of those newest ones. So. I can provide those to you. Great, thank sure. you. You're welcome. Alderman Boren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief, I talked to you about this a, a month or two ago uh, in, in this report under 4.6 paramedic rotations. And I was somewhat surprised to see that uh, there was a recommendation here that there be a, a program where the, where the staff is rotating. For example, if you've got, it says here 40, possibly 40 paramedics, but only 20 of them are actually doing paramedic work. And it says here that uh, with, that means that department paramedics are not receiving hands-on experience that keeps them current. Currently, no program is just exists to support ongoing hands-on experience for all EMS providers. And the recommendation is, I recommend that mandatory program uh, to keep, I was, I was a little bit shocked in that <clears throat> uh, you mentioned that it's the, newest, it's the newest members of the department that go, go out on most of the EMS calls. And you've got the, uh, you've got the, the other paramedics who are very, very experienced and it seems to me that uh, 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 maybe a good, and maybe you're already doing this already, but a good way of doing this would be to have an experienced person on the, on the ambulance and then a newer person. And I think that the, the citizens, uh, I shouldn't say they're being shortchanged, that, I'm not trying to say that, but if you've got these other persons that are so experienced and they're no longer on the ambulance calls, don't you feel that, that the ambulance service is missing out on something by not using these people that are very, very experienced and only having the newbies on the, EM, on the EMS calls? It's let, me, a, let me clarify that. The paramedic rotation, that's my recommendation. <coughs> and some of it has to do with contractual obligations. We can't force the more senior people to take those calls they can choose to pass it to the next least senior in some cases? In some cases, but several, several of those positions are promoted, promotions, drivers, lieutenants, captains. Um, and that experience that they had when they were young is great because on every run they go on, they have that experience. They still, many of them still maintain their certification. So it's, it's, a, it's a plus. And we're looking into that. That's something that we but, wanted to but, look into. But you're not using your most experienced people on the EMS calls. We are because an engine and a truck goes, an, an, a paramedic unit and an engine often go together. Sure. Because of the staffing needs and to move patients and things like that. So these people are still on the scene and can mentor and oversee <clears throat> people on the runs. But our youngest members start on the ambulance. That's the way it works. Uh, they go on the most runs. They need the most experience, and that's where it's at. Mm -hmm. So it's a natural progression for them to start there and then work their way up after a few years. I guess my point is the more senior paramedics would have seen more things and have more experience than the newbies that are just coming on the job. And if, if, if you could match up some of the more experienced people with some of the newbies, 
the experienced ones have seen a lot of different types of calls over the years, know how to handle certain things. And the new ones, in many cases, they're maybe just coming out of school. Maybe they work for another department, maybe they haven't. But I just feel that this recommendation should be a priority uh, to, to, to utilize the experience. You know, I, I just think, uh, is it that after they've been on the ambulance for a while, they don't want to be on it anymore? Or what? why aren't we utilizing all this experience? No, we are. Um, every paramedic unit has two members on it, a senior member and a new member. Okay. So they are getting that experience. We don't okay. just put two new, brand new members together on an ambulance. That okay. would be, I mean, I think they'd do fine, but it's not the best situation. So we don't do that. So they do get, but eventually those people, the senior paramedics, get promoted and move off. However, they still came from being a paramedic. They have that knowledge. So when they go on runs with the med unit, they're still there with the senior paramedic and the young paramedic. Then I, if I could just follow up, I have one more question. And then on, on your various uh, bullet points here with finding recommendations, uh, I don't see anything, uh, anything about a succession plan in place or contemplated. Uh, and I know we've talked about that. In fact, this goes all the way back when Chief Herman was was first hired. I wasn't on the Salary and Grievance Committee, but I attended some meetings. And that Salary and Grievance Committee advised Chief Herman to identify talent in the department and try to encourage the talent to get the necessary credentials to someday become a assistant chief uh, uh, or, or the chief. And has anything like that been happening where the fire department has a succession plan? Part of, part of the first six months yeah. that you came, that Chief <clears throat> was hired, we put a questionnaire out with regards to a skills analysis, which also identified education levels. So that, that didn't make this report because it's already in process. There is a disconnect between uh, most firefighter paramedics get a two-year uh, two -year degree. Right. Some choose to go on into the bachelor's. But mm -hmm. to your point, we do have a, a void down the road of you know, a good, good amount of qualified candidates to take promotion. So we've identified it. <clears throat> it, was, it was really interesting. Uh, when you came on board, uh, Chief, I happened to go to the uh, Milwaukee Fire Department website, and I was impressed with your credentials, of course, but I was amazed. And of course, the Milwaukee Fire Department is a much bigger department than the Sheboygan Department. But I was amazed uh, and I guess somewhat surprised that the majority of the leadership in the Milwaukee Fire Department at a minimum have the bachelors, and a lot of them have degrees in public administration, and that's almost all the way through the leadership of the Milwaukee Fire Department, and that's certainly not the case in our department, and I realize, I don't wanna, you know, I can't compare the Milwaukee Fire Department to the Sheboygan Fire Department, but I just found it interesting that, uh, is there a different culture in the Milwaukee Fire Department that encourages, uh, or do they have a succession plan where they encourage people to go back and get a degree if they don't have one. Uh, why is it that there's such a disparity in leadership here compared to Milwaukee in, in academic credentials? I think that's per perception. Um, the younger members coming on are more educated. Uh, a, a higher percentage of the of paramedics we have with just a few more classes or maybe another semester, not even, can a achieve that associate degree. People. Once the bar's been set, and this council, you or the council members have set the bar high for the fire chief's position in terms of educational minimum qualifications. Everybody knows that now. And they know that if they want that, they have to get it. it there's no question. It's not even a question anymore. Nobody even talks about it, argues it, or does anything because they know it's there. And to get promoted in the fire department, even in Sheboygan, also Milwaukee, you know, a lot of it's on you. It's up to you. And to set yourself apart from the group, you have to excel in different areas, academics, your job performance, how you do your job. I always say the best, the best lieutenants make the best captains. The best captains make the best chiefs. The best battalion chiefs will make, you know what I mean? Yep. And that just holds, you know, they're first there, the last to leave, they're the best at what they do. And that carries through all the ranks. So we have people in school. We have more people in finishing college degrees now than we ever have on this okay. department. I know that for a fact. And um, uh, they'll be ready. So I think that's happening, and it's a part of succession planning. They know the bar's been set. They'll, they'll meet it. They know what they need to do. 
Was it all was was it all self motivation in the Milwaukee Fire Department, or was yes. leadership was leadership identifying people and encouraging them to get to, besides the fire department experience to get the academic requirements to move up in the Milwaukee Fire Department? Yes, they. Um, it, it's really internal. It's it's on you. Um, there's no minimum requirement to take a promotional exam for lieutenant or captain or battalion chief. Obviously, for the chief of the department. I would in Milwaukee minimum would be a, a master's degree now minimum, and in fact we had people apply that had PhDs. So, um, and the same's going on here, all right. Um, and it's really internal. You know, it's up to you. What do you, what can you do? And it's a it's a it's a totally personal matter. You know, I don't. My children are are gone. They're out of school and they're working. They're not home. You know, when I had a young family, I, you know, I did go to school. It was tough. But my wife at the time said, you can do it. So we, we worked it out. So it's very case by case, and people put their families first. But when they can, they are going back to school and finishing up their degrees. I have one, so, more, one more to follow up, and that is, uh, is the disincentive gone? I know we had a disincentive, I think, was, uh, was it with the lieutenants or something, or going up to captains, where it was, it was more advantageous for salary and benefits to stay in the union rather than move up. Has that obstacle been removed where now if somebody does want to move up and they, they get promoted to a captain and they're no longer in the union, they're not going to lose anything benefits-wise? It's, it's definitely improved. It's never a guarantee at this point, but it is improved because they can be frozen at their, their rate when they left the union to mm -hmm. take a promotion. So we've, we've definitely made some good strides there. Mm -hmm. okay. Any more uh, comments or questions? And I, we really need to, to keep our discussion on, on 2.1, which is a job description review. Any other comments, questions? Um, I think the proper motion, although I'm open to uh, correction, would be uh, a motion to accept and file. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion to accept and file. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye. We'll move on to 2.2, .2, which is a fire department operational review. Bye. And Chief Romas, I think, again, we've seen most of this. Um, in your, uh, just as an introductory question, in your job description review and your operational review. Have you identified any particular areas where um, job descriptions could be changed, organizational structures could be modified, or other ways of doing business might be pursued? Mm -hmm. um, you want to share that? Yeah, we're doing that now. We added a battalion chief July 1st, and things were reorganized. Positions were added uh, to increase accountability and uh, management within the fire department for EMS and for um, inspection. That was done. Um, when it comes to the job descriptions, this, in preparation for the study with, with uh, Sandy, that was the third time that I personally, as chief, have reviewed the job description since I've been here. I mean, any chief, any especially new chief's going to come in, and he, that's one of the first things they're going to do is look at the job descriptions and see how they line up. And you're always thinking about how can you reorganize and make things more efficient and better and maybe save some money or, or whatever, anywhere. You're looking for that. So I started out with that. I, was, I wasn't even here two months, and I did that. And then after that, um, then there was the issue of the captains and the chiefs and overlapping duties and responsibilities. So I once again, with Sandy's help on occasion, we talked and looked at them and looked to update and you know, uh, modify those job descriptions and in some cases we did, I think in one or two we did. And, um, and then again, I did it for the third time for, you know, in preparation for these things, for this study and, and, and along those lines. So your it's been extensive, yeah. Okay, but your table of organization has remained essentially the same? No, I wanted to change. And next year I'm asking for three more firefighters and another battalion chief. And then I'm going to put my battalion chiefs that were on the hybrid schedule back on shift. If I can get that second chief, I believe that it is possible to do that then. So there's a change. And then in 19, I'm asking, in my plan, I'm asking for three more firefighters. The 
Captains are doing the same thing. Lieutenants are doing the same thing. Assistant there, chief is doing the same thing. Deputy chief is doing the same thing. No, we, there's some tweaks. Uh, like when we added that battalion chief, we took some of the responsibilities off the <coughs> deputy chief so that he can focus on what he's supposed to be doing, like um, uh, job, dis not job descriptions, um, SOGs, SOPs, uh, strategic things, you know, um, efficiencies, operations, uh, management, oversight, quality control. A lot of those things were falling by the wayside, and that needed to be stepped up. And I knew that, but I needed somebody to be able to do it. Now I ha that person has the time because those other jobs have been given to the other battalion chiefs. Any other questions or comments? Alderman Sorensen. Um, Thank you. Um, Chief Romas, so, uh, so in your plan that you, you said you want to hire more battalion chiefs and firefighters as well. Yes. Um, did you look at any reviewing of, of the scheduling of, uh, of uh, firefighters? I know it's like they work three days, have a few days off. Did you look any at possibly changing that as well um, when adding the additional uh, headcounts? Yes, I mean, not, not changing the shift. I mean, the shift is, I, I looked, I mean, there's different ways to do it. I came from a shift where there was one day on, two days off. Um, our department runs under, the, we call it, I call it the California system. That's what we called it for decades. But it's, it's, in essence, the same work shift in a 27-day cycle. Both schedules work the same number of days in 27, just differently. That's all. So... That I don't see changing. I don't see going to 10-14s, 12-12s, changing it you know, one day on, two days off. I don't see that happening at all. I don't think that would be very efficient or would work out for a department and a city our size. Okay. Alder Hoshu. I just want to make sure I understood you. When you you're putting in to hire some more firefighters and a battalion chief, then they're going to shift. Does that mean your battalion, ch battalion chiefs are going to be going to 24-hour Three of them will be. And yes. then that's the one thing that we have kind of been talking about for months and months and months and months. I believe so, yes. So now yeah. once we get these new ones in, then we'll be able to put the battalion chiefs on 24-hour shifts, leaving one for administrative duties then? There would be two, on, so two extras on a 40-hour week, yes. Now how is this all fitting into the footprint of a, the annexation of the town of Wilson? Um, the properties from the town of Wilson that we're annexing into our city, which is very close to my district, mm -hmm. station number five, wondering how is that going to change the outlook of station number five? Um, the plan was in place before we did any annexation, before anything was even talked about. So the plan's going to help us to begin with. It's going to help us with the annexation, though, also. Okay, like it just goes hand in hand. Is. The plan is, and... Um, I would like to hire three more firefighters next year, raise the daily staffing from 22 to 23. We're going to add one person per shift, okay? So we'll start with 23, and then come the vacations and over, or, um, sick leaves and injury leaves or whatever eats up the extra people. Right now, the daily minimum is 16, which leaves us with three firefighters at truck four on the north side and three firefighters at truck five on the south side by themselves alone on the apparatus and they can go down as low as two all right i believe that there should be at least three people on those apparatus so i'd like to raise the daily minimums to 17 and ladder four right now is busier in a higher density population so i was going to add a person to that firehouse and have them run with a minimum of three because they're by themselves, but then they'd have at least three people on every run. Then, in the following year, in 19, I wanted to add another three and then increase the staffing at Station 5 from a minimum of two to a minimum of three. Now, the NFPA standard states it should be four. NFPA says we should have four in every rig. Well, that's not possible, and I don't believe that it's unsafe, but I think two is... It's not unsafe, but it's not an ideal situation. So I just want to understand this correctly. With this annexation coming forth, mm -hmm. possibility of more ambulance calls in that arena, mm -hmm. you're still going to manpower the north side station with three <clears throat> versus the south side station. Right now that's the way I see it. Because, I mean, we just annexed, I don't know how many 
single family homes that included, but I don't think it was a whole lot. And there's no development there yet. There will be yes. a, a new industrial park. You know, I'm sure there's going to be other additions or building going on, but that won't happen for a little while. So by the time 19, don't forget, we're looking at January 1st of 19, then we'd hit the ground running and we'd be where I want to be. And I think we'll be fine on the south side also. Where do you feel that that extra ambulance that we don't use should be placed? That's also something we discuss and look at. Um, we're looking at, and this is all, we're just conjecture. <laughs> we're looking at runs. We're looking at where they're located. Uh, we just adjusted the paramedic units to um, uh, spread out the workload among them, and it worked. It, 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 what we thought was going to happen happened, and we spread out the workload by moving med four from station four over to engine one and making it med one right downtown where the majority of the runs were okay so that's all spread out um but we're looking into possibly putting a fourth one in service and if we have these other two people that we're talking about there'd be a little more staffing give and take so that we'd be maybe be able to staff a med unit but then we'd be right back where we were with with the, the vehicles the trucks with the staffing uh minimum of two and that's something i don't want to do if i ask for this, I want to go through with it and stick with it. I'm so. just concerned with the railroad, I mean, with railroad tracks. We've had this issue mm -hmm. nonstop. I've been fighting for this nonstop for more years than I care to remember. Mm -hmm. the, the railroad tracks aren't going anywhere. No, they're not. The population is growing on the south, especially with the industrial park and now this annexation. I don't think it should be poo-pooed. I'm, I'm not poo-pooing poo taxes it. just like everybody else does. Right. But that's, we have Station 5 there. We do. We do. That was a big, big thing. I, it was huge, tremendous. You're telling me. It was closed down or browned out, and I know the, the citizens spoke, and it was you know, overturned, and we staffed it again, and things like that happened. And so don't forget, we have two minimum of two, prob, you know, possibly three people working down there all the time. And they're EMTs and some of them possibly ex-paramedics or current, currently certified paramedics. They're not on the med ring, but they're still paramedics. They're there. And they can initiate all kinds of care until that med rig gets there. So they're not waiting for a med rig. They're, they're taking care of the patient right away as soon as possible. I'd just like you to give that some consideration when you're making your decisions mm -hmm. well, for my district. I will. I hear you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments, questions? Mr. Sorensen? Uh, I, I kind of went back to the hiring of the additional battalion chief. And you said... Uh, in response, I think, I believe to Alderman Bourne's comment that essentially one would be kind of left behind for more administrative tasks. Can you kind of give me a walkthrough about what those administrative tasks would be? What's the normal, essentially, not nine to five, but what's the normal work, uh, what do you envision the normal work day would look like? That, you know, the deputy fire chief couldn't do, the assistant fire chief, um, any of the current battalion chiefs, or any of the secretary or uh, data entry clerk could do? that if there's such a need for a full-time position for that. That's an excellent question. The first, um, the first thing is these chiefs, the, the two administrative chiefs that I want, we have one now at starting July 1st. We started two months ago. Um, they're on a 40-hour week, and believe it or not, that's huge for our department and our office. Um, when somebody's on shift, they're on shift. So they work one day, and then they're off, and they work, and they're off, and they work, and then they're off four days, so if there's vacations in there, they could be gone a week or two. Now these administrative duties where people, see everybody else operates Monday through Friday, nine to five. All the builders, you know, um, hospital staff, anybody else we deal with outside, uh, even in the city, but outside the fire department is nine to five, Monday through Friday, eight hour shifts. So when they call, they want a response. They want to be taken care of. And I want that too. <laughs> so them being there just eight hours a day adds another person to the shift at the battalion chief level so they supervise everybody a chief on a 40 can call up a captain and say I, you know what i need you to take the rig down here we have to go and, and meet somebody to do a sprinkler test or whatever all right so that's a huge plus right there it's already i see it happening now with bob our battalion chief on the 40 working in inspection right now so i see a change there they're also available at that level, and they can fill in as a chief. You know, they can go to fires. They're available for recall at home. They can come in. So that's another, another nice added 
thing because we lost we lost four staff members between well between 2004 and 2017 we lost we went from 14 people that were doing jobs to 7.5 doing the same stuff so it's providing a relief what's happened was we're just able to maintain we're doing it we're doing things right we're not breaking you know we're following all the laws of the state and we're giving good service but the things that really need to be done to take us to another level just weren't being done we're just treading water and we need we need to advance we need to move forward i want to i want to make us the best we can be so to do that i'm not saying go back to those pre level staff but a few more would really help and i have a plan to you know make it all work so i don't know if i answered your question did i a little bit i gave you two examples but yeah. there's probably others thank you other questions comments alder nelson well, we're talking about today, and we're talking as far as 2019. Uh, do we do any strategic thinking towards the future? Specifically, what I'm thinking in my mind is the um, we know that like volunteer fire departments out in the country are uh, withering away because mm -hmm. of demands of training and and that sort of thing, and people just aren't interested in it. And so. Um, this potential f to go from a city fire department to uh, fire districts is that what is that the correct term? Uh, yes, it, it can fire be. Fire yes. service it, areas, right? Fire service areas. So, I would hope that the goal is any planning and tactical things that we do now might fit into a future strategic plan mm -hmm. of what might it what might it look like in twenty five or two thousand and thirty in terms right. of a fire service area. Right, I, and I agree. And we've gone a long way with uh, when um, Daryl got here and we started doing the city strategic plan. Because if you think about it, that's where it has to start. Right. Because we're one of whatever, 12, 13, 14 departments in this city, and our strategic plan needs to fit into the city strategic plan, but there wasn't one, so you know, there's nowhere to go with that and everybody's kind of spinning around, but that's not the case anymore. Right. And through that, we're held accountable with metrics and, you know, we're always checked over and looked at every quarter and things like that. So that's happening. Um, and that's critical. And we do do that. We're always looking ahead. You know, we're, we're, are, we're growing. We knew we were going to grow before we even grew. And we're always talking about that at staff. What can we do? And I went to a seminar for a, a certificate and I sat next to a guy from, I think it was Toronto, Canada. Their city had a hundred year plan. I said, that's impossible. He goes, no, it's not. We got it. I said, cut it out. So they, I don't know how they forecasted that or they made a lot of assumptions and guesses, but they had one. They had one. So I found that to be, you know, unbelievable. But yes, we, you know, that's my job as the chief. I'm a, I'm, I try to think strategically. You know, everybody else is down here and I'm up here, you right. know, and, and Daryl and the mayor and you are up here and you're thinking about everything and how, what are we going to do and how are we going to make this last and all that. And I get it because I'm below that, but I'm still above the captains and the lieutenants and the chiefs right. and things like that. So that definitely has to be. And it's being addressed and it's working. I mean, things are happening positively. And the big thing is day in, day out, fires. We just had another fire. We, we performed outstandingly at we kept it to the room of origin you know EMS runs heart attacks everything we just we were always there and we always do it right every single time that's what I strive for that if I can do anything that would be what I want and we are doing that but you're right we need to take it to another level other comments questions um, I just have a final question um, the possibility of adding six additional staff uh, from a budget perspective is um, a stretch mm -hmm. at best. Mm -hmm. what, what tools or assistance will you need in the next two years if those six firefighters don't become a reality in order to think through better ways of doing business? In other words, if you are a zero-sum game because mm -hmm. governments are zero-sum games these right. days, um, what will you need to help you address the needs of the city without that really substantial expansion? Um, I would like to increase the management staff level even a little bit. That would be very, very helpful to help us manage the department you know, better. 
But you have a chief, an assistant chief, mm -hmm. a deputy chief, mm -hmm. three, four battalion chiefs, mm -hmm. five captains, ten lieutenants, and you want to increase that. Yeah, I want to increase the staff. Yes, I do. The I feel that we need staff to do that. as right. opposed to the line staff. Yes. Yeah, that would be my first choice. You know, I'm asking for one more chief and three firefighters next year. If you asked me to pick, I'd pick the battalion chief. That would be the thing that would most impact positively both the department and the city. Now, don't get me wrong. I still want my firefighters. But if you say, if you ask me for either or, that's what I would tell you. I might, you know, I don't know how the budget's going to go. We just submitted our budget. You know, Daryl's budget's in, and it doesn't agree with mine. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So I don't know where this is all going to end up. I don't know, and I understand, I understand, but I, I have to fight what I believe is gonna be the best thing for the department and the city. Very good, anything else? I think we're looking then for a motion to accept and file. Madam Chair, make a motion to accept and file. Is there Second. a second? Second. All right, any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor state aye. 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 Any opposed, chair votes aye. Very good, now we will move on to 2.3, which is uh, billed as our Fitch and Associates uh, webinar presentation. Um, and I think if I can, I'm going to ask Alder Bellinger just to kind of introduce this and kind of get us situated. And, and I think we have a PowerPoint, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I wanted to have something like this done about six or seven years ago when I first started on the council. At that point in time, I approached uh, the then Chief Herman to see if he would support that. He said, absolutely not, I do not support that. And um, it, uh, it, it failed and, and we never got to the RFP stage. Uh, this time around, um, I went back again, seeing as how we have a new, or a, a a, a more recent fire chief and said, you know what, I think it's time that we look at this. My goal was to take the politics of the union out of it, take the politics of the council out of it, and get some independent third party consultant to come in here and, and look at um, the fire department uh, being an $8 million budget roughly and, and see if there's some um, ways that we can uh, do things better, save some money, um, you know, or, uh, you know, look at different staffing, look at uh, um, how many stations we should have, where they should be located. Is the fire or is the ambulance uh, service being, uh, the accounting being done correctly? Um, is there opportunity for a more regional fire department? Uh, there's issues with the town of Wilson right now with their fire department. That, that may be something that that could be looked at. Also, is there um, other funding mechanisms, you know, grants, you know, things like that, that, that we could go after to help us out uh, to, to fund this? And, and that's what this study would do. Um, when I went in, in, when I had this idea, I met with the fire chief and uh, some of his leadership, and at that time he said, I asked him if he would support it. He said, absolutely, I would support it. Um, I'm, I'm all for more information, he says, but candidly what you're going to find out is that what all the information you're going to get, it's going to say, say that the way we're doing things is perfect and it's just going to validate everything that we're doing, but, but I, I'll, I'll support it and I'm in favor of it because more information is, is better. I then met with the, um, the union and the union said um, they would support it as long as there were no preconceived outcomes that would come out of this study. If I did not have a direction that I wanted to turn this fire department and I was going to skew the results to get the outcome that I wanted. Um, I assured him that said, I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I don't care what the outcome's going to be. I just want a five or ten year plan presented by an independent third party uh, that is an expert in the field to uh, give us some direction. They said, okay, I will support that. Um, then it came down to, you know, two or three weeks before there was going to be a vote. The chief comes, sends me an email, says, I don't know if I can support it now. I'm feeling a little wishy-washy, and I'm, I'm not sure what's, what I'm going to do. And uh, then the union said, you know what, We're not, I'm not supporting it anymore either. And uh, then about a week before the vote, the, fi the fire chief sent me an email and said, nope, I'm not supporting it. And so... Um, but, but prior to that, I met with the fire chief, the union, and Daryl, 
and we went through and we decided what the scope of work would be for this study. So this was an, a mutually agreed upon scope of work that we wanted to put in the RFP to ha put out. And, and so it was agreed upon by the fire chief, the union, Daryl, and myself as to what, would, what that scope of work would be and what would be contained in that RFP. That was all mutually agreed upon. The RFP went out. Six or seven people replied to it, um, and Daryl and his staff and some other people, I'm not sure who all was involved. I was not involved. I don't believe anybody else on the council was involved. Looked at this in a blind fashion and all the proposals without knowing who was pre presenting what. They ranked them, and then they presented you know, the, the outcome, and the outcome was uh, they chose Fitch and Associates. So Fitch and Associates had a two-phase plan, and um, the phases could run concurrently, and it would be uh, roughly a six-month time frame to complete the study at a cost of $59,000. I've been in contact with Steve Knight of Fitch, and uh, during this delay in this whole thing and bringing it back up with this new council, and I've asked if that uh, pricing still remained valid today. And um, he's, he assured me as long as the scope of work remains the same as the RFP as it was originally laid out, that that pricing was still valid. So with that, I would like to introduce Steve. Steve's got a PowerPoint presentation, I believe. It's going to be about 15 minutes, and then he will be able to answer any questions. And Steve, if I've misstated anything, please correct me. No, I think you're you're right on target. Is the audio okay? Um, I think so. If it yeah, doesn't go scream ahead. at us, yeah. <laughs> so. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, briefly then, uh, and I'll try to keep it under 15 minutes. I know you all have a uh, uh, considerable dialogue already this evening. Uh, Thank you for allowing us to come before you again and, and present and kind of give you a brief overview of what we have to offer. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about our firm, if you'd go to the third slide. Uh, our firm has been around for 30 years in the public safety uh, consulting environment. <clears throat> and uh, I've been with the firm for uh, just about four years now and in total have probably led uh, somewhere around 40 to 45 uh, independent consultancies uh, with fire and fire-based EMS departments. Uh, my background, personally, I retired from St. Petersburg Fire and Rescue in Florida as assistant chief, uh, and it's a metro-sized department, uh, and along the way, uh, I earned a PhD from the University of South Florida. I have a master's degree in public administration and my bachelor's degree is in fire and safety engineering uh, from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, for on the fire side, the credentials, uh, I'm an executive fire officer uh, and actually was uh, brought on as one of their contract instructors for the executive fire officer program at the National Fire Academy. And I also worked with the Commission on Fire Accreditation International uh, for about 10 years as a peer team leader and assessor uh, of fire departments going for international accreditation. So I have a fairly well-rounded uh, experience in the fire service uh, as well as being a third generation firefighter. So after I retired from the fire department, I uh, worked for and ran the ICMA's uh, mm -hmm. fire and EMS consulting arm for uh, about, about a year before I had an opportunity to move over and join Fitch and Associates. So that's just a little bit about me and the firm. If you'd switch to the next slide, Mary, I appreciate it. Uh, so just a little bit about our experience right now. We're currently working in Waukesha County uh, with four uh, smaller departments that we're looking for uh, shared services. That's really just underway. It's taken us a long time to, to get their data uh, moving. But I just wanted to give you a sense of you know the municipal footprint that we've had uh, across the country. And this is all in the last two years. Um, across, you know, Minnesota, Illinois, Texas, Florida, California, Washington, et cetera. So many of those, I won't go into great detail, but many of those are, are much larger and many of those are right in the same uh, general size and, and footprint of, of your city as far as scope and, and uh, 
extensiveness. So uh, if we look at your project team, just briefly, I already introduced myself, but uh, one of the other members I would bring with me is Chief uh, Bruce Moeller. Dr. Moeller uh, spent his career, he started in Illinois, ended up in Florida, but uh, he was a fire chief of a metro-sized fire department. Then he was a fire chief of a city very similar to yours, and eventually was city manager of that city. Uh, and then uh, when I met him and, and he finally retired, he was the assistant county administrator uh, over uh, all public safety in a large urban uh, county in Florida. And then Chief B.J. Jungman uh, works for the city of Burnsville uh, in Minnesota in a similarly sized city. Uh, so all of our consultants that work in the fire and EMS side spent their careers there. But as you can get a sense, we have a well-rounded uh, view of both not only the fire services, culture, and operational needs, but we also balance all of the political, fiscal, and economic environments to make sure that we, we provide a well-rounded uh, assessment. And any of the data analyses are, would be completed by Dr. Gong Wong or Teresa Johnson. Uh, financial analyses does, would be done by Diane Wright. Uh, she retired from the uh, Metro Dade or Miami-Dade uh, Fire Department many years ago. And then our GIS is done by Brian McGrath, uh, who runs his own uh, CAD consulting issue. Um, so very briefly for the data collection, and I won't read all of these, but I think you can get a sense if uh, you move to the data collection slide um, that we have a very robust approach of trying to make sure that we are highly inclusive, highly transparent, and all of our recommendations and observations, alternatives, etc., are all grounded in, in justifiable objective database sources. So uh, we don't come in and try to recreate uh, any you know, previous fire departments or previous projects we've been on. We, we really let the uniqueness of each community, the political environment, economic environment, the real risk that's uh, occurring in the community, we let that all drive uh, our decision making. And the reason we do that is to make sure that we ensure uh, that we insulate ourselves uh, away from any bias, including allowing any of our clients to uh, influence results as well. So to, to John's point. And then as far as the objectives, uh, this came right out of the RFP that you all had uh, put out, I guess, maybe a year ago or so now. But uh, the phase one really be an organizational operational review, uh, which is really, you know, um, uh, a top to bottom review of the, of the department. We'll look at optimized deployment strategies, your station locations, conditions, functionality, et cetera. We'll look at the service demands, the type of risk, your performance, uh, talk about staffing over time, scheduling, uh, which I know is part of your brief discussion uh, prior to me coming on. Then we'll look at future growth, uh, much like your discussion on annexations, demand for services, you know, how to best position yourself for the long term, and then any gaps uh, between where you're at today and, and any best practices because uh, really our strategy from our firm is to bring quality information that's objective and data-based uh, to the to the policy group mm -hmm. so that you can establish policy uh, because we know that that policy is 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 established and set uh, at the local level it's it's not our position to to tell you how much risk you're willing to assume or not uh, so the phase two, we'd come back and look at, you know, analyses of the financial viability and sustainability of the ambulance service in particular. And our firm has a steep history in the EMS side. We had our own billing company as well as we manage uh, through management service contracts. We manage several ambulance systems uh, around the country as well. So we, we not only know the analysis policies and the analytics, uh, but we also practice what we preach and, and we continue to refine and learn and, and grow as we manage uh, different systems ourselves. So you can see uh, cost containment, sustainability, uh, a pathway for the future is really the overtone of, of bringing all these elements back together to have an objective uh, third party look to help you along your way. So as far as risk, one of the things, if you go to the next one, sorry, about risk-based system design, one of the things that we, we do is we try to quantify the prospective risk, which is really your potential risk that you have in the community. And that comes in a lot of different manners, but one of the manners uh, is the occupancy level risk, which I'll show you in just a moment. But what we want to do is make sure that we understand that 
and, and articulate to you the difference between the need for more stations and a defined response time versus much like the chief was alluding to in his request for additional firefighters of having a higher concentration of firefighters at the stations that you're, you currently have. And the way we approach that is really use a risk-based approach so that we can better define how you can achieve at the desired service level in the most efficient and effective manner. So speaking of that, uh, this is just one of the, uh, the tables that we use, a risk matrix for the occupancies in your community. And we would take all the occupancies, whether that's 500,000, 3,000, what, whatever the situation is. And we would classify the occupancies available uh, either through your own records management system or we can uh, use the ISO uh, batch report is generally where we get the first step. Uh, and we look at things like the needed fire flow for the, for the structure, the number of stories, square footage, whether or not there's a basement, uh, whether or not there's a sprinkler system, uh, the construction class, the building combustion class, so how quickly will it burn, et cetera. And we all rate that and come out with a numerical score. And then we plot each one of those scores, not only on a map, but we'll come back and use a three-dimensional model that takes into account the community demand for service, the call concurrency, or the rate of simultaneous events. Uh, and then we look at all the high and moderate risk occupancies that exist within each fire station area or station demand zone. And the reason we do that is that's the tool that we'll use to really define whether this station needs a, a single unit, whether it needs multiple units, whether you know two firefighters is right, three firefighters are right, four firefighters are right, whatever the scenario. So we try to differentiate uh, to the most efficient value based on the risk uh, specific to your community. So in the end, really what we're looking from a policy position is really finding the right balance. So on one hand, we have the expectations and the fiscal realities for service, and then on the other, we have risk that exists in the community, your performance, your demand, your operations, et cetera. So we have to balance all those. One of the things that we do that's unique to our firm that really has worked uh, probably, I would suggest, better than anything else I've seen uh, in articulating the return on investment for your, for your investment in the fire and ambulance services and we, this is a margin utility model that we use, and it's basically like a diminishing return. Uh, now, obviously, you don't have this many stations. This is exaggerated uh, if you're on the slide for margin utility. Uh, what it shows is out of the 20 fire stations in this community, the first four could get you to the desired performance. And in this particular community, I think it was an eight-minute uh, response time. But that's not important because you'll define uh, what what level of service or what desired performance you want. But for the sake of the model, what it shows is, is that the first four stations could get you to almost 92.2 or 92%. So it's 91.91 in the far right column. And what that shows is each, each station's contribution to the overall performance of the system as a whole. So your collective number of stations. So if you look at the very first uh, row, it would uh, it have the number one up there. So the number one ranked station would be able to capture 50% of all the calls in the community from that one station. And then it's cumulative if you just focus on the far right. The second station would get you almost to 81%, the next station 88, uh, 91. So right now, the best practice in the system, both for NFPA 1710 as well as accreditation in the fire service is to measure to the 90th percentile. Really what that means is that you're saying 9 out of 10 or 90 out of 100 times, this is the level of service that we can guarantee or better. So when you look at this model, what's significant is if you, if you track 